Welcome to the underground. I'm Jody. I'm going to share a song with you that I wrote. Um, it's a prayer of a man who grew up in the church and didn't consider systemic racism. And he might have said, all lives matter. Until he knew the person of Jesus Christ, um, the love of Jesus Christ that would leave the 99 just for the one. So this song's called Just For One. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, big bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia. to sun. 
Strange Fruit, that is the title of our sermon today, The Strange Fruit of Racism. The song you just heard was made popular by Billie Holiday. It was a song that she would perform night after night to close her shows. It was her way of getting the message out getting the word out about what was happening in her community. This song that you just heard was originally a poem called Bitter Fruit, written by Abel Maripol in 1937. He wrote the poem after coming across a postcard from a lynching in Marion, Indiana that had occurred in 1930. This postcard was sent all over the country as a souvenir and a memento of an occasion when two young black teenagers were lynched. This incident and the photo have become an icon of the lynching era in America. I want to tell you that story about what you will see in the picture. I'm going to share that picture with you at the end. So I just want to let you know ahead of time some of the things that I may tell you in this story and the picture at the end may not be suitable for small children. This is a sermon though that is necessary. It's necessary for us as Christians and this is a message directed to all of us who call ourselves followers of Christ, directed to the church. But first, the story. On August 6, 1930, Claude Dieter, a 24-year-old factory worker, was shot and hospitalized. Three black teens were arrested and taken to the town jail on the night of the event. The next morning, a small crowd began to gather outside the jail. Throughout the day, the crowd grew larger and larger. One of the young men, the youngest, who was 16-year-old James Cameron, he recounted seeing the crowd grow into a mob during that day. People arrived with picks, sledgehammers, crowbars, and even pistols. As the day went on, many witnesses recall it being a very hot August day. And there was a sense in the air that something was going to happen. No one really knew for sure what was about to occur, but there was a tenseness in the air and everyone was on edge. Normally, lynchings occurred in the South, but this time, in this town of Marion, Indiana, where a white man had been shot and three teenagers were being held, there was a heightened sense of, of something that should has to be done to these individuals by the crowd. And as that emotion grew over the course of the day, it came to its highest point that evening, about 7, 7.30, it was announced that Claude Dieter had died. And after he died, the police went to the hospital, collected his bloody shirt, and they hung it on the flagpole outside of the jail. The bystanders said that that bloody shirt was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. The crowd's intensity grew to a fever pitch. They demanded that the young men be brought out of the jail so that they could inflict justice upon them for Claude's death. The jailers refused to open the doors. 
They stood inside, some with guns drawn, others stood outside talking to the crowd. As time went on, the crowd pressed their way up against the jail door. The chief of the police commanded his, his policemen not to shoot into the crowd as there were women and children present. As the crowd's intensity grew stronger and stronger, the police could no longer restrain the mob that had gathered. They used their sledgehammers and beat against the jail door until finally it gave way. About 25 to 50 of these mobsters rushed into the jail and first they grabbed Thomas Shipp, a 19 year old from his cell. They began to beat him and kick him and yell and curse at him. By the time they dragged him out into the street, from his jail cell, he was already senseless and half dead. Then it seemed that the whole crowd, which had grown to at least 1,000 people, some report even more, were present, began to surround him. They all tried their best to get their licks in, people hitting and kicking, people hitting him with crowbars and bats and sledgehammers. To make matters worse, someone began to jab a crowbar through his chest repeatedly. By this point, it was clear he was already dead, but more and more people from the crowd came up to get a glimpse and to get an opportunity to kick him or to hit him. Some threw rocks if they were not close enough to reach his body. They then dragged him to a tree and hung his body there in the tree. After that, the crowd returned to the jail for their next victim. Abram Smith, an 18-year-old, was dragged from his cell next. He was beaten, kicked, stoned with rocks. Insults, insults were hurled at him as well. But he was still alive when they dragged him to that tree to hang him with the new rope that members of the crowd had gone to the hardware store to purchase. As they put the rope around his neck and pulled him up. The young man used his hands to keep the rope from strangling him. So then his assaulters lowered his body back down, broke both of his arms so that he was unable to hold the rope away from his neck. They again raised his body up and there they hanged him. Shortly after this point, a local photographer set up his camera and began to take pictures. He's the one who filmed, who photographed the image that became widely known of this event in the postcard. After pictures were taken, people posing with the two young men's bodies hanging in the tree, the mob decided to go back to the jail and get the third young man who was accused of this murder. They went back to the jail. They began to beat him and pull him out of the, sh out of the jail. Just then the police chief said, haven't you already done enough? You've murdered two of them, leave him be. Now Cameron, James Cameron, he was the youngest. He was 16 but they say he was very small, built very slightly, and he looked like about 12 years old. The crowd would not yield to the police chief's call, to his, his cry to them to leave this young man be. They pulled him out into the streets, beating him all along the way as they dragged him towards this tree as well. They threw a noose around his neck. And just as they were about to raise his body up into the tree to hang him, James Cameron says he heard a voice. And not only did he hear a voice, but others in the crowd heard a voice calling out. He doesn't recall exactly what the voice said, but for some unknown reason, the crowd stopped in the midst of what they were doing. And they decided not to hang this young man. They lowered him back down. 
he was able to run back to the jail to safety. To this day, James Cameron does not know exactly what happened, but he credits the, um, the mother Mary. He said it was a woman's voice that he heard. He was a devout Catholic, and he credits her with saving his life on that day. James Cameron was later tried and convicted of this crime. He served four years in jail. And many years later, in the 1990s, he was pardoned for this alleged crime, this alleged murder. But he committed his life to telling his story. He wrote a book called The Night of Terror. And he was the creator and the director of the Black Holocaust Museum, which kept a, a written history and a photographic history of the legacy of lynching in America. The photographer who shot this infamous photo, Lawrence Beechler, went home that night and he printed hundreds and hundreds of postcards, which he sold the next day on the courtyard steps. Lynching is a part of our history, a dark part of American history. Lynching was formally abolished many years ago, but lynching has never really ended. More than 4,000 African Americans were lynched across 20 states between 1877 and 1950. Then these lynchings were often public acts of terrorism designed to instill fear in the black community. Government officials frequent, frequently turned a blind eye to these incidents and often condoned the mob violence. Perpetrators did not attempt to cover their face as they had no fear of retribution. Some would even boast of their participation in the mutilation, beating, dragging, castration, raping, shooting, burning, and eventual hanging of their victims. Ordinary people participated in these horrendous events. Farmers, teachers, even preachers, district attorneys, and US senators have been quoted as stating they were participants in various lynchings. One key component to all lynchings was the sense of spect spectacle, the carnival-like atmosphere that drew people from miles around with their children, women, entire families, old and young, would come to witness this awful sight. People came by the thousands. It was gruesome and horrific, but not spoken against by many pastors and many Christians in that day. This event occurred on August 7th, 1930, which was 90 years ago this month. That is why I bring this story to light because as I said, lynching has never really stopped. There are modern day lynchings of black and brown people today that take place at the hands of police and even by ordinary citizens. Racism is often seen as a taboo topic, something that we should avoid speaking about. But 2020 has shown us by way of a pandemic and by way of protest sparked by George Floyd's murder, that it is high time for us to break our silence. It is something we can no longer avoid. If we are to be about our father's business, we have to actively work to weed out racism wherever we find it. We can no longer pretend that it doesn't exist. We can no longer ignore the strange fruit of racism. This sermon is for the church, in particular, in particularly the evangelical church, a message that is long overdue. I am preaching to the choir, or at least I should be, 
Because if we were honest, we all already know the truth in our hearts. We live in a racist society, a caste system, if you will. And racism is still alive. What is racism? Many think of racism as a personal bias or a personal attitude, maybe a prejudice towards one individual to another. But racism is bigger than that. Racism affects every aspect of American life. It is a systemic problem, a structural disorder that has been woven over time into the very fabric of America. Recently, a young woman, 22 years old, Kennedy Mitchum, sent a message to the editor of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary asking them to expand the definition of racism to include it is a systematic to include it is a systematic advantage based on skin color she wanted the definition to reflect more of the systematic structural problem that racism has become the evolution of the word from referring to a personal or individual attitude to referring to a social and political system and structure and society as a whole continues to evolve. But one thing to keep in mind is that racist people create racial, racist societies. Racist people create racist societies. For an example, consider the racial disparities we now see with COVID-19, higher rates of infection and death for minorities and the poor due to lack of access to health care and living wages and adequate affordable housing, children forced to attend underfunded and resegregated schools lack access to internet and computers. And higher levels, African Americans also face higher levels of exposure to environmental hazards, which have led them to have many pre-existing conditions such as asthma, heart disease, and cancers. Racism is a strange fruit that is still bearing here in America. When did this all start is a question I've often asked myself. Where did racism come from? Why does it even exist in our world today? Satieties that chose to build their economies on the slave trade had to justify these decisions. And this is where racism began. First, it had to be justified. So in 1442, King Henry of Portugal got Pope Eugenia IV to absolve colonial pirates and slave traders of the sin of human trafficking. The selling of their African brothers and sisters was allowed due to the Pope declaring that these Africans were heathens and pagans, that they were not Christians. Hmm, that I found odd because if we are diligent in our study, we will find that the oldest churches in the world are found in Africa, in Ethiopia and Egypt. But this Pope declared that the Africans were not Christians, therefore it was justified, it was okay for them to be treated in inhumane ways because they were pagans. Later in 1452, Pope Nicholas V sanctioned the enslavement and dehumanization of Africans again based on the notions that they had no souls. The Western church began to teach these lies. This false teaching morphed into concepts of hierarchy and white supremacy. The idea that humankind could be separated into a pyramid or onto levels of a ladder, putting some people at the top and others at the bottom based on the color of their skin. In America, we then see theories like manifest destiny and the doctrine of discovery. 
that took scripture out of context and used it to rubber stamp criminal, vile behavior, the annihilation of the Native American population, and the enslavement of 12.5 million Africans was said to be ordained by God. Mm. As time went on, American churches and schools began to teach about race as if it were fact, as if it were scriptural and an anthropological fact. They taught in schools about the Caucasoid, the Mongoloid, and the Negroid in a hierarchical order. Much of this was based on the so-called curse of Ham and the table of nations. This went on for centuries. These teachings on the curse of Ham and the table of nations were even taught in the last 20 to 30 years. Many of you may have even heard these fables. We can blame the flourishing of racism on the concerted effort of the church, national leadership, and overall government in an attempt to maintain economic wealth and social and political power. Let's take a look at the scripture. We're going to look at this curse of Ham. It's found in Genesis chapter 9 verses 18 through 29. And it reads, just to give you a little context, I'm sorry, before I read it. This talks about um, after the flood, after Noah and his family are allowed to come out of the ark. This is where we pick up. God has blessed them and told them to go forth and replenish and multiply and feel the earth again. So this is verse 18 after that has happened. The sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Jepheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and he was drunk, and he was uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Jepheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backwards, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan, shall he be his servant. Verse 27, God shall enlarge Jepheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now to give you some context, like I said, this scripture has been used to condone slavery and even racism. In chapter 10, they talk about a table of nations and it is assumed or it has been taught that the three sons of Noah are responsible for three ethnic groups or races of people that we see in the world today. Let's uh, dive into this a little bit deeper. I want you to know the Bible was written prior to the invention of race. It was written before race was ever a thing. Race was never used as a measuring stick or as a way to divide or define people 
in early times. So the text already we can see is being distorted, is being twisted to justify some inhumane behaviors on the part of our brothers and sisters. So let's look at the distortions. The first one, like I said, they call this the curse of Ham. So the first distortion is that Ham was the one that was cursed. The second distortion, Ham and his descendants were turned black. The third distortion, all of Ham's descendants should serve as slaves for all times to their brothers. And the last distortion is that Noah's three sons, they each represent three different races or species of humans. <laughs> Today is about truth telling. Let's get to the, the bottom of this. If we, if we look at the scripture, you can clearly see that Ham was not cursed. Noah specifically said Canaan and not Ham. So Canaan was the one who was cursed. God had already blessed Ham, Shem, and Jephthah, along with Noah, when they came out of the ark. So now I find it hard to believe that Noah would curse what God had already blessed or who God had already blessed, which was Ham. So Noah does not call Ham's name. He calls Canaan. Ham was Noah's third son. Canaan was one of Ham's sons. And so that makes many people, many question what happened in the tent. Who was in the tent? Was Ham in the tent or was Canaan in the tent? What happened in this tent? And that's not the purpose of our sermon on today. There's been much debate on what took place in the tent. But there was something that took place that dishonored Noah. And when Noah came to, when he sobered up, he cursed Canaan and not Ham. So we, by what is said, Canaan is implicated in this matter, whatever took place in the tent, Canaan was somehow involved and he is the one who received the curse from Noah. So we got that straight. So Ham was never cursed. God had already blessed him. The second one, the second distortion that we're going to unravel was that Ham and all of his descendants, all his sons and all their children and their children's children on down the line, that they were turned black, right? They say Ham is responsible for the inhabitants of the continent of Africa and that they all were turned black by God as a part of this curse. But we do not find that stated in the text, nor is it otherwise implied. Never in the Bible, I've searched, I could not find it, never has anyone ever been turned black in the Bible. Now there is an instance when someone was turned white by leprosy, but never has a person been turned black. So we can dismiss that notion right now. The next one, all Ham's descendants should be servants for all times to their brothers. Well, before we go to that first, that next one, I'm sorry. Before we can go to the servant, let's talk about a little bit more about that being turned black. They were not turned black. They were born black, right? We talk about the Bible here. And if we believe what the Bible says, earlier in Genesis, it talks about the creation of man and woman and then being placed in the garden. It talks about where this garden is. And it gives you the rivers and the demarcations as to where you can find this Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was on the continent of Africa. Some say in the area where you now find Ethiopia. So if these inhabitants were descendants, Noah's children, Noah himself and his children were descendants of Adam and Eve, they lived on the continent of Africa. They were made out of dirt, which is usually a black or brown color it would stand to reason that these people had already had brown skin. This was nothing new that happened to them. God has given humans the ability to adapt to whatever environment we live in. If you live in a, a place where there's lots of sun and heat, 
Melanin is what protects your skin from that extensive exposure to the sun. So it's very likely <laughs> that they were already black. Praise God. So let's get that straight. So all Noah's sons were already black. No one was turned black. Noah um, did not um, cause them or speak a curse that turned anyone's skin black. Canaan did end up being a servant to his brothers. That did occur. The curse that Noah pronounced on Canaan did come to pass. Um, later on, when the Israelites drove the Canaanites out of the promised land, this did come to pass. So again, that verifies that it was not Ham that was cursed, but Canaan who was cursed by Noah. And then if we look a little closer, it keeps talking about brothers, that even though there is this curse, and that Canaan is to be a servant, it says to who? To his brethren. To his brethren. So again, this is bringing us back to the notion from the beginning in the garden that we are one family, that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, right? That's what the Bible teaches. There is no insider, no outsider, no black, no white. We are all one family. There is no hierarchy in humankind. We all are brothers and sisters. The Human Genome Project has proven this to be a fact. In their studies, they found that all human beings, no matter what they look like, no matter where they live at on the planet, we are all 99.9% .9 the same genetically. Isn't that something? 99.9% .9 the same. No matter how much we think we're different, we are all the same. We're one family. And we ought to start acting like it. All right, we're all Adam and Eve's kids. So now we know that there is no basis in the scripture for racism. No basis in the scripture for white supremacy. No basis in the scripture that any people on the planet are doomed to a perpetual state of subjugation or slavery. Did you hear me? No people on the planet have ever been cursed by God and doomed to this sort of circumstance. Sad to say that the church played a major role in these types of beliefs and ideas being spread out across the nation and across the world. So if we are to end racism, it's going to have to start with the church speaking the truth. We have to be honest about the failings of the past, about our misunderstandings, our misinterpretations, about outright lies that we're told. We have to be honest about that. So in order to end racism, it starts with us. Maya Angelou has a saying, she says, when you know better, you do better. <laughs> All right? So now we know better, we ought to do better. We're going to do better. We're called to do better. The church needs to first confess, repent, and then work towards changing this mess that we've made. Both white and black were miseducated and lied to. We have all eaten from the strange fruit of racism, and it has influenced how we see ourselves, how we see our brothers and sisters. This bitter fruit has soured our educational systems, our textbooks, our legal systems, our pulpits, our churches, our Bible studies, and even our understanding of the word of God. We must embrace the whole truth. Dr. Tony Evans said this, the legacy of original sin of the culture has never fully been addressed. It's never fully been addressed. Now we're being forced to address that. The church has endorsed slavery, Jim Crow, inequity and inequality from the beginning. And it's time to address that because our very souls and the soul of America depends on it. 
restoration is possible. We need reconciliation and restoration in the family of God. And it starts in the church house and then spreads out from there. We are to lead the way in this call for restoration and reconciliation. But first, we cannot skip over some necessary steps that have to take place in order for any meaningful change to come about. We must embrace the truth of the Bible, not embrace a whitewashed version of the Bible, but realize that the Bible is a multicultural book. It represents all God's children, all God's people, and not just one particular group. All right, can we face that fact? If we do, we'll begin to grow up in Christ, all right? <laughs> grow up in Christ and be who he's calling us to be. So first we have to confess. James 5, chapter, chapter 5, verses 16, verse 16 says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. <laughs> whole and healed. That's what we need in America. We need wholeness and we need healing. All right, we, none of us have been living the life that God intended for us because we all have been crippled by the effects of racism and white supremacy. Make this your common practice. Just make it your everyday thing. Nothing special. Nothing that you only do here and there on a special occasion. But this is your everyday, your common practice. Confess your sins to each other. Is that all right? Can we confess? Can we be humble enough to confess our sins to each other so that we can live together whole and healed? If we confess, forgiveness follows. Anytime someone sincerely confesses, forgiveness normally follows after that. And then, so once the confession is made, we have to repent. Repent is not the same as confession. Repent means to turn from the evil that you've been doing. Turn from your sins and do something different. Change your ways. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people... <laughs> you know this one, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, all right, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. America, we need the sin of racism forgiven. We need healing in our land. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, help us. We need your healing. But it only happens if, what? God's people would humble, <laughs> humble themselves and pray and seek God's face. Then, then, all right? Then he promises to bless. Study the word for yourself and search your heart. Is there a need for repentance in your life? The last step is that we all have to begin to work for equity. The church can no longer be shaped and molded by the culture. We can no longer strive to be in favor with the world's systems and to be in their good graces by participating with evil. The church can no longer afford to do this. No longer can we strive to be right in man's sight, but be on a steady road to hell. Mm -mm -mm. Lord, bless us. Help us now. Give us strength. Lord, we need you to change the hearts and the minds of, of not people who don't know you, Lord, but those who do know you, those who profess to be followers of Christ. Lord, we need you right now. The last scripture I'm going to leave with you, Psalms 89, verse 14. It says, your throne is founded on two strong pillars. The one is justice and the other is righteousness. We serve a God of justice and we serve a God of righteousness. Let's strive. Let's strive for justice in our world. 
Let's do everything in our power to live righteously. Right, to live in right relationship with our brothers and sisters. Let's not let anything separate us or divide us or to forget who we are, that we are all God's children, that we're all a part of his family. We are one, hallelujah, in the spirit. We are one in love. Hallelujah. Yes, we are. Lord, we thank you. We thank you now, Lord. Help us. We're going to pray, Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, we need you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to make sure we are not guilty of the sin of racism. Help us, Lord Jesus, to make sure we're not guilty of apathy towards racism. Lord, please forgive us if we have participated in spreading this ugly, strange, bitter fruit, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would root out whatever is in us, Lord, that's not like you. Lord, we pray you would give us courage, not just the lay people, Lord, but give your pastors, your preachers, your evangelists, Lord, your priests. Give them courage to speak boldly, to speak the truth in love, Heavenly Father. Your word said we should know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Lord Jesus, we need to be free. We need to be free. Hallelujah, Lord. Free us from any division, anything that separates us, Lord, from one, and another, one another, and anything, Lord, that would separate us from you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would remove this strange and bitter crop of racism from us. Unite your children as never before, Heavenly Father. Give us the courage to love one another. Help us, Lord, to realize who we are and whose we are, Lord Jesus. We are your children. We belong to you. Lord, help us to live a life to please you. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.